few definitions, so please interrupt me if something's not clear. Okay, please feel free. Um, so this is joint work with Avi Benaroya and Amnon Tashma from Tel Aviv University. And uh, yeah, I'll talk about dispersers and their application to erasureless decodable codes. Um, but let's just get right to it, okay? And let's define what a strong disperser is. So it's a function. It gets two inputs. The first is uh, of length n, the second is of length d. And uh, let's treat this function as a bipartite graph where the first input is on the left hand side and the second input is written on the edges. So it's a two to the d out regular graph. And on the right hand side, we only have zero one. Okay, so it only outputs one bit. And what do we want from this function? We want, okay, so, uh, sorry, the second input is called the seed. And what do we want from this function is that for every subset of the left-hand side, which is large enough, of size at least capital K, we have that for all but epsilon fraction of the seeds, when I evaluate dispersal over all x's in x and on that specific y, I cover, I cover zero one. Okay, well in other words, for every good y, and we have plenty, we have one minus epsilon good y's, there exists some x1 and x2, such that this x1 y is zero and this x2 y is zero. Okay, and I'll just uh, emphasize that this set of good seeds is determined by x, so it's not, we can't have a global set of good seeds. Okay, so our set x determines the set of good seeds. Okay, it seems uh, simple, but it's quite challenging uh, to construct uh, such good dispersers. Now, throughout the talk, we will need the notion of weak sources, although it's not that crucial in dispersers, but we will need it. Yeah, uh, in, the, in the notion of uh, weak sources. Okay, in, in a second I'll write it, yeah. yeah. Uh, so what's a weak source? We say x is a nk source if x is a random variable over zero, one to the n, and for every, uh, it has mean entropy at least k, meaning that for every x, the probability of x, uh, that, that I see x is bounded. It's at most two to the minus k. So it looks something like this. And uh, when I talked about sets, it's actually equivalent because you can think of the weak source as a flat source and treat x as a subset uh, of cardinality at least two to the k. So you can always think of such sources. This is a support of the distribution. Exactly, yeah, this is the support of the distribution. So in the notion of uh, weak sources, so what's a one bit strong dispersal? It just, uh, that for every nk source x, which k is for k large enough, for all but epsilon fraction of the seeds, the support of this uh, distribution for almost every y is zero one. Okay, so we may have bad seeds, okay? For example, this is a bad seed because it maps all of the x's to a single element. Okay, but typically, a seed is good, so let's, just so we have it throughout the talk, so what's the dispersal? That for every nk source x or subset of size at least 2 to the k, we can write it like this, that on average over all seeds, the size of the support of this xy is larger than two times one minus epsilon. Right? Okay. Okay. So we won't talk about this, but I'll just mention that if we output m bits, so the natural extension would be this definition, that it covers, that on average it covers uh, at least two to the m, uh, one minus epsilon times two to the m values. 
And if you're curious about the strong in the definition, so if we're not interested in the strongness, we're allowed to waste the seed and only require that the union over the y's covers uh, almost all 0, 1 to the m. Construction there are easier, okay, but today we'll talk about strong dispersers. Now, dispersers are important in de-randomization. Uh, the classical application is for uh, error reduction of one-sided error randomized algorithm uh, in a very randomness efficient manner. But they're also used in, uh, as an ingredient in various pseudo-randomness uh, objects in heating sets, in PRGs, and etc. Okay, so questions about dispersers? That's a great question. Most of the talk will be devoted to this uh, question. So just in a few slides. Okay, but if something is still bothering you in a few slides, no, you tell me. you want this to be as small as possible, and you want, you want to follow the uh, K as, as small as possible. Yeah. Okay, so a dispersal is kind of a weak ob. Right, and, and as Avi said, a dispersal is kind of a weak object because you only want to cover most of the output. In this case, exactly zero and one in the one output bit case. Now, if we were want to do it uniformly, meaning that roughly half will give zero, roughly half will give one, this, strong, this uh, stronger object is called a seeded extractor. Okay, maybe um, more of you know extractors than dispersers, so I'll just, uh, give it in a picture. So this is a dispersal. Up to some error, it covers many elements of 0, 1 to the m. In an extractor, we wish that up to some error, the distribution will be roughly uniform. Okay? So just to practice, in the random variable uh, language, an extractor is such that a function that for every nk source, for all but epsilon function of the seeds, this random variable, it's not only that the support is 0, 1, it's actually close to being a uniform bit. Okay, so for every good y, roughly half of the axes are uh, evaluated to 1, and half of the axes evaluate to 0. Okay. And again, the set of good seeds is determined by the distribution itself. Okay, now extractors have many applications, uh, but we'll mention none of them. Okay, just, uh, this is not an esoteric uh, definition. Okay. Good. So when we encounter a pseudo-randomness uh, object, uh, as, as one suggested, we want to know, like, what do we want? What the parameters we want, right? What, the, what does the probabilistic construction give? What are the lower bounds? So let's see what they are about dispersers, okay? Because we want to construct dispersers. So we have two key parameters. We have the seed length, which we want it to be as small as possible. And we have the entropy requirement, okay? Or how small can the set X be for the definition to kick in, right? For it, for it to give us this uh, requirement. So let's talk about how small can D and K be. Yeah, so we want them to be as small as possible, and our three parameters are n and epsilon. Okay, so as functions of n and epsilon, what can we expect? So the seed length, uh, non explicitly, and also a lower bound up to a constant, is uh, log n plus log 1 over epsilon. Non explicitly just meant that the random function will have this form. Yeah. Exactly, with high probability, so. And it's also a lower bound, meaning that we cannot hope to find like a singular function um, that occurs with small probability that achieves better, okay? And the constant ones in such 
Yeah, yeah. So when, when I say up to additive constants, it's like plus O of 1. Okay, no. Okay. And I think quite surprisingly, maybe, the entropy requirement can be very tiny. So this K here, or if you want to think about the, the size of the set, uh, so K can be as tiny as log log 1 over epsilon. Okay, so optimal dispersal work for extremely small sets of size order of log 1 over epsilon. Okay? And now that it's independent of n. Okay? Good. So these are, these are our uh, two parameters that we should hope for. So just put them here. I need to do both of them. <laughs> ah, this will be challenging. <laughs> I think I don't think I aced it, but <laughs> Okay, why do we care about dispersers if we have extractors, right? Extractors are stronger. So if we get a uh, like weaker no notion, can we hope to gain something from it? So it turns out that dispersers' parameters outperform seeded extractors. So we can indeed uh, hope to um, achieve something. For example, the seed length of extractors, you see there's a two here, so the, the seed length must be at least log n plus 2 log 1 over epsilon. This is actually important, but this may not impress you. So if you're not impressed by this 2, in terms of entropy, for dispersor, it's, it must be exponentially larger. Okay, for extractor, sorry. So the entropy requirement of extractors must be at least 2 log 1 over epsilon uh, and compare it with the log log 1 over epsilon. And I just want to, uh, to convey a message that it's not only playing around with parameters. So constructing weaker notions of extractors, for example, dispersers or condensers, if you know them, um, they were useful. Uh, for one example, I can give a recent example, was for achieving near-optimal two-source extractors, uh, just if you know it. Um, so we, we were able to overcome a barrier by constructing a specific condenser to replace an extractor that was used there. Okay, so just a recent example for, for, for the use of such, a, of such an agenda. And I will soon show you an application to coding theory um, that, yeah, th that their uh, optimal strong dispersals will be very useful. Okay, so questions up until now? So what do we construct? In the small epsilon regime, we managed to construct near-optimal uh, strong 1B dispersers. So for every constant gamma in a small enough epsilon, we get D, which is up to 1 plus epsilon multiplicative constant uh, optimal. So it's 1 plus gamma log 1 over epsilon. And uh, entropy order of log log 1 over epsilon. Okay, where the O here um, depends on gamma. Where is the log n in the D? Right, but because we're at this small epsilon regime, so you can put log n here and even shave off a little of the gamma. Questions about just the statement? Exactly. Okay. 
So, yes, yeah, so currently what you would want to take is just uh, a code that approaches the GV bound. Uh, this would give you the best dependence on the N, on the log. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, so this now would give you like four. Um, but yeah, you can take risks. Yeah, yeah. No, but just a side remark, the Am Amnon's construction about a uh, code that approaches the GV bound still does do not give us optimal seeded extractors outputting one bit because you need to go through the Johnson bound and you lose something. Okay, okay and I'll also say in terms of the, the regime of parameters that when the error approaches one, I mean, being one minus little o of one, uh, it's also interesting, but it's a whole s different set of parameters, and I won't talk about it. So today, think of epsilon as being one over poly n, okay, for, non for a large enough poly. Okay. Good. So now let's take uh, this definition and see how we can construct uh, good codes from it. Questions up until now? Okay. So, what's this decoding from erasures? Say I'm giving a code which is simply a function mapping n bits to n bar bits. We say it's uh, 1 minus epsilon L erasure is decodable if whenever we're given some uh, code word or any um, any word in the domain of in the codomain of C, sorry, and some malicious adversary erases all but epsilon of the coordinates. Okay, so all but epsilon of the coordinates were deleted, and we know where these erasures occurred. So someone replaces uh, them by question mark. We are guaranteed that there exists a list of size at most L. We want the list to be small. That contains the original code world. Okay, we can't exactly reconstruct from this pattern the code world, but we want a small list that the code world will be there. Okay, combinatorially, we can't uh, uniquely construct it, reconstruct it. But we can output a short list. So we work over the binary field, which is the most challenging case. And in the erasures model, again, in the erasures model, we know where something went wrong, in which coordinations. In contrast, if you know the Eros model, in which we allow some half minus epsilon bit flips, okay, this is the, uh, the Eros model, but we work with the erasures model. And here, we also have uh, key parameters, right? We want to construct good codes. And the first parameter is the code's rate. So it's, uh, recall that the code maps n bit strings to n bar bit strings. And we want this uh, rate, n over n bar, to be as high as possible because this gives us less redundancy while keeping the list size small, right? We have these competing parameters and we want to optimize their dependence. Okay. So is the definition for regularly decodable codes clear? Okay. So what about the rate? We want it to be as high as possible, right? What can we hope for? So it can be as large as epsilon. And recall that epsilon is a fraction of, of, number of, the, num of the coordinates we keep. Okay, so it's pretty high. And in the Eros model, if you compare it to uh, codes of distance half minus epsilon, there, sorry, there the rate must be at least epsilon squared. Okay, so 
by handling erasures, we are allowed to uh, construct codes with better rate. And what about the list size? This is the number of possible codes word that like, have a, a legal completion, right? So, in fact, the list can be very tiny. It can contain only log one over epsilon code words. Okay, and in the Eros model, uh, poly one over epsilon is necessary. And I'll just uh, mention, I think it's, it's an interesting uh, perspective, that for linear codes, um, actually 1 over epsilon is, uh, is optimal. Okay, so if we insist on a linear code, and there are reasons to, to do so, we can't hope to achieve log 1 over epsilon. We, we achieve at least 1 over epsilon. So, I've see, so you've seen the dispersers bounds, and now the erasure uh, list decodable bounds. And if you're kind of sharp, then they, they seem familiar. And for a good reason, because they're actually equivalent. OK, so I'll show you just one direction. It turns out that if I have a disperser uh, from n bits uh, with seed length d outputting one bit, with R epsilon and an entropy requirement K, we can explicitly construct a code mapping N bits to capital D, which is two to the D. And what are the parameters of the erasure list decodable codes? It can handle one minus two epsilon erasure, so roughly the same as the error of the dispersor. With this size, that's two to the K. So you see that the entropy requirement of the disperser in, uh, is directly related to the list size, and the seed length affects the rate of the code. Yeah. And what's nice about it is that this reduction is optimal, in the sense that if I give you an optimal disperser with d, which is log n plus log 1 over epsilon, and an optimal k, what we get is an optimal list decoding for erasures with rate epsilon and list size log one over epsilon. Okay, so we don't lose anything. Okay, is this clear? So when you say optimal division, this is sort of like sending in a three thousand eight code and just sort of checking to get something. Exactly, you can't hope to get anything better. Yeah. And that's another strong way to sell money. Exactly, exactly. So. Because, okay, so because you're, they're equivalent, uh, you can do all the arguments on dispersals, and then, uh, but doesn't matter. The same holds, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and linear, uh, linear for dispersers. Yeah, it's actually a very good question. I'll talk about it like in the last slide uh, because they have many uh, implications. So. Yeah, linear, linear dispersers are interesting, I think. Yeah, I'll talk about it like for a minute. But you said it must be worse bound than linear. I'm sorry, what? But it must be worse bound than linear. Yeah, so in terms of D, you can hope for the same. But um, in terms of K, so for linear, OK, the converse also holds, meaning that from codes, I can get dispersers. Um, and as I hinted before, I just want to emphasize that any binary code of high distance can handle 1 minus 2 epsilon uh, erasures. But it will have a list of size polynomial in 1 over epsilon. And due to bounds we have, for example, if you know the LP bound, um, such codes cannot break the rate epsilon square bound. Okay, so we really want to break this uh, epsilon square bound. So kind of the moral is that to get list decoding from erasures that outperform list decoding from errors, we need very good strong dispersers. Okay. 
So if you plug in our dispersers through the coding reduction, what you get is a code with this rate, epsilon to the one plus gamma, and this list size. Okay, so we managed to break this epsilon squared barrier due to the LP bound in the errors uh, model. Okay, so we indeed outperform list decoding from errors. Okay, so just a few previous results. Um, Gurusuame and Gurusuame indeed had a couple of results, uh, but they're only explicit for large epsilon. So it turns out that uh, prior to our work, uh, the best uh, list decoding from erasures you could have is simply by choosing a good enough code uh, with high distance. Okay, but with such a code, you cannot hope to uh, break the uh, epsilon squared bound. Okay, and we, uh, we managed to achieve that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, right, what's important is the dependence on the epsilon, so, but for concentrate, we don't, we don't get anything. Yeah. This is all in the small epsilon regime. Okay, so the reduction from uh, dispersers to codes uh, is very simple, so that, that's just it, it's pretty simple. It will give us a chance to practice the definition. So uh, if we start with the disperser, uh, having error epsilon and entropy requirement k, we want to construct a code c, uh, mapping n bits to two to the d bits, uh, and we'll do it in the most obvious way. We're given uh, some message over n bits, and we want to construct c of x. So how are we going to do this? We will just evaluate the dispersal on x and every possible seed, right? So for example, this x, y, one is zero, so we put here zero. This is zero also, we put zero. This is one, we put one, zero, etc. Okay, so the parameters make sense, right? We map it to two to the d bits. Good. Yeah, the rate makes sense. Good. Let's see why it works. As I said, it's pretty simple. So let's take any word of length capital D. So someone comes and erases all but say two epsilon d of the coordinates. Okay, so they are erased, but we know the value on, let's say, uh, the coordinates indexed by t, and let's say this value is uh, r. Okay, this is the coordinates we know. And we ask, how many code words are there with legal completion, right? So let's say a is the set of all x's for which c of x is a legal completion, Meaning that for every x in A, the evaluation on T is exactly the same evaluation on T. We want to prove that A is small, right? Because A is exactly the list. So why is this true? What is the support size of this disp AY? Okay, so we call that for an element A, little a, so disp AY is simply C A in coordinate y, right? So if y is in the coordinates we keep, then it's obviously the support size is one, right? Because it's exactly z in y, a r in y, sorry. Z in y, it's the same. Otherwise, we don't know because it was a race, so it's at most two. So if you do the math, on average, the support size is at most this uh, two to the size of t over d, so it's at most one minus epsilon times two. So this A must be small. Why? 
because if A was larger, then the disperser would have to kick in and give us this, right? Okay, so A is small and A corresponds to the list size. So questions, dispersers, and codes, to codable codes. Okay, so, so there is a general question on how to construct such 1B strong dispersers, right? Because on one hand, on one hand, uh, we need all but epsilon fraction of the seeds to cover zero one. This is, this is the definition. But on the other hand, we don't want to do it uniformly because this would give us an extractor and we want to outperform extractors, right? So it's kind of challenging. So say, typically, this x, y is only epsilon zero close to uniform for epsilon zero, which is much larger than epsilon. So think of epsilon as one over poly and, and epsilon zero as anything non-trivial. Okay? So we want a large fraction of the y's of the seeds to be good, but each of them not that good. So now we, we will need another definition, so it's a good place for questions, yeah. But we will, okay, so now the, the new player that comes into picture it's a new kind of extractor, and this will, this will give us what we want. Okay, so this new kind of extractor, I'm sorry for all the definitions, but please stop me if something is not clear. So this new kind of extractor is a two-source extractor. So in a two-source extractor, we only have weak sources. We have two weak sources, say x and y, the first one, let's say over n bits with mean entropy k, and the second one is over d bits with mean entropy d, d prime. And what we want is that we sample, uh, they're independent, so we sample x from x, y from y, they don't affect uh, the, the uh, marginal, uh, the joint distribution, sorry. And what we want is that on average, over the samples, we, uh, we, we apply the uh, two-source extractor. We want that on average, it's it's, uh, it gives us a uniform bit, so up to the epsilon zero error. And the epsilon zero can be large. Okay, so this is a two-source extractor. Again, both sources are weak. Right, thank you. Correct, forgot about that. So in the seeded extractor that we defined earlier, just d prime is the same as d. And then you have a uniform seed. But here, y is weak. Yeah. So let's shift our view of uh, the connection uh, of, of how we see them as graphs. And let's put the first input uh, on the left-hand side and the second input on the right-hand side. And let's put an edge between uh, two inputs if and only if they value to one. Okay, so let's uh, see it that way. So in terms of weak sources, a two-source extractor is such that for every nk source x, for every d d prime source y independent of x, this function 2x of xy is epsilon zero close to uniform? Okay, think of epsilon zero as large. Okay, we usually want it to be small, but think of it as large. Okay, just to you know practice the definition. If we use the sets notation, so for every large enough set on the right hand side, 
for every large enough set on the right hand side, we get that the induced graph is neither a clique nor an independent set. Okay, this is also called a bipartite Ramsey graph. So note that we focused on studies unbalanced setting where n is much larger than d. Okay, and think still of n and d as our n and d. So d is logarithmic in m. Okay, you usually think of the same size as the same uh, size as being of the same size. And what I want to show you now, that such a two-source extractor is a one-bit Thorn dispersal. Okay, it's exactly the same thing. Even no, no simple reduction is needed. But you have to say what D prime is. Right, exactly. But to say what D prime is, let's see what are the parameters of such an extractor in terms of dispersals. Okay, so given a set X, Let's just say that B0 is a set of bad Ys in the sense that they evaluate only to zero. And likewise, let's say, let's define B1. So we know that both B0 and B1 can't be too large, right? Why is that? Because otherwise we would have a large X, large B0, and there would be no edges between them. But it's a Ramsey graph, right? So there must be edges between them. So if we do the math and count and sum up the support of X and Y, obviously if Y is in B0, then, then it's only one. If Y is in B1, it's only one. And otherwise it's two. Okay? And what we get is that the error of of such a function, if you treat it as a, as, a, as a disperser, oh, sorry, this, okay, yeah. I see the confusion. So this should be, What we get is that the error of the corresponding disperser is given by not epsilon zero, the error of the two source extractor, but rather d prime minus d. So the small error of our dispersers comes from supporting small entropy rate, supporting small d prime rather than outputting, outputting a close to uniform d. doesn't appear anywhere. It could be, it could be n anything non-trivial. It depends how you define the statistical distance. Could be one, could be half. Anything non-trivial, yeah. Yeah, but what are non-trivial Here, when you, when you said that uh, B0 and B1 should be at most of the D prime, th then you needed this Ramsiness property of the two source extractor. Yeah, so add something to it. And, oh, sorry? Right, it can be any non-trivial epsilon yeah, zero. Where does non-trivial come in? And where does the fact that it's non-trivial? <laughs> ah, the fact, okay, the fact that, right, if you want to say that, that you have no edges between two sets, then the statistical distance of between Well, yeah, so right. So, if I want to say that there must exist an edge here, then this should be like smaller than one, right? Or half, no matter how you define it. Yeah. So this is the epsilon zero. So we need epsilon zero to be less than one. Yeah. And if you know the only a constant boundary, 
Right, right. Any non-trivial epsilon is zero. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Okay, just to recap this discussion, what's cool about two source extractors is that they allow us a separation between the error coming from bad seeds, and it's true for every two source extractor, and the error epsilon zero coming from the distance to uniformity of the good seeds. So high error two source extractors can imply low error strong one bit uh, dispersers, as long as, they, as long as they support small enough entropy. So by constructing two source extractors, just to plug in parameters, just you don't have to follow it, just believe me, but if we construct an, uh, two source extractors for an NK source, and the DD prime source for D prime is gamma D. We call this the entropy rate. Okay, this is gamma. What we get is a strong dispersal with this seed length corresponding to an erasure decodable code with this size, with this list size, and this rate. So you see that to, to beat the epsilon square bound rate on codes, we must achieve such a two source extractor with gamma which is smaller than half. Okay. Questions? Okay. No, no with, uh, arbit with an arbitrary gamma, arbitrary constant gamma. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. For every constant gamma. Okay. And no previously known uh, two source extractor has comparable parameters, even the new ones. Okay. So just to, to, to tell you what we get. So in our case, you're right that epsilon zero can be any non-trivial uh, number, so anything smaller than one, sorry. What we get is a construction for every constant epsilon zero, where k can be extremely small, and d can be very small. So this, these are the parameters we want. Right? And this, in this unbalanced regime of parameters, uh, you can do the probabilistic argument and see, um, and also well, there's a lower bound, so our uh, two source extractors are close to optimal. And if you're interested in the balanced regime, you can stretch the D all up, and all up to N. This will not be optimal, but this uh, will give something new, a new balanced two source extractor where the first source has entropy order of log n, and the second one has entropy gamma n. So this improves upon the extractor by ran raz that gets epsilon, uh, any, epsilon, any epsilon larger than half. Okay, so we also get uh, gamma, sorry. We also get gamma smaller than half. Okay. And we'll mention Raz's extractor in a few slides. Okay, so questions? Okay. So kind of summing up the different object that we had, uh, some implications were already known, so I just put the citations uh, if you want. And this is kind of how we, we managed to get those, okay. constructor source extractor, and then get all the other objects. So I won't bore you with the entire construction, just a few words about the construction, the first steps of the construction, but I'll be happy to talk about the rest offline. Um, so how do we start? 
We're given an nk source x, a weak source with entropy k, and another independent source uh, of length d with entropy rate gamma. And we want to extract one out one bit, right? One bit with the which is epsilon zero close to uniform. And again, this gamma is called entropy rate. In fact, if this gamma was larger than half, as I hinted before, this problem was already solved by Ran Raz. Okay, so Raz gave a construction that supports a gamma which is 0 0.6. Okay, in, in such a case, this random variable, Raz XY, will be very close to uniform. Okay? But you already know it's a problem, right? Why, why we can do this? But in, in the code sense, it will give a good list size. But the problem is gamma is larger than half, so it won't break the rate epsilon squared bound. Okay, we need gamma to be smaller than, uh, smaller than half. So what's the obvious uh, thing to, to think of? Well, let's, let's increase gamma, right? So we get some random variable with mean entropy gamma d. Let's try to increase this entropy rate. Okay, and increasing entropy rate is called condensing a source. So we want to take this y, which has gamma d mean entropy, and transform it to some other random variable, y prime. You see that this green uh, thing became larger, that has 0 0.6 entropy rate. And the obvious question, and morally, what we would want it then is to apply Rader's extractor. Okay. Great question. So the, the, the question is, so, but you know this answer. To, to this question, you know the answer. So what was your question? No, Sorry. No, so my question is, so, um, <laughs> let's say you don't have the two source extractor. You have your two base base pressure. So maybe you can use the heat uh, to do this. But this then it won't be strong, because I want strong dispersers. Uh -huh. So we can't waste the seed. But we need this another seed for condensers, and we want yeah, to save. Yes, yeah, so, but then we'll have, but we want another source to use the RAS extractor. No, this condenser is a very uh, uh, <coughs> If you are only after a dispersal, you can take the union of the output of the condenser on the different seeds. Well, this is uh, well. This is what well. This is what I'll do. But again, I can't just um, if you're outputting the union, then you're not strong anymore. Okay. I want one output. Okay. So it turns out that you cannot condense deterministically. Okay. So you need a, you need a seed. So. What we want to do is construct, come up with a function that increases the density of the source, and it's uh, a very famous problem. But to apply such a function, such a condenser, outputting d bits to m bits, we need the uniform seed. How do we get it? So we obviously can use another independent source, but we, want one, we don't want to do that because we want a two-source extractor. Okay, and we want to save our x. And another option, as we do many times in derandomization, is to enumerate overall possible seeds. Okay, and this will give us a table, y prime, such that we take our sample from y and just run over all seeds of the condenser. Okay, so we output cond y, s1, s2, up to s a. Okay, and now this, this table is only a function of y. And the number of rows of y prime is the number of possible seats of the condenser, obviously. And this would be a constant uh, number of uh, rows, since you're going from constant gamma to constant. Exactly. 
So if we combine existing construction, we manage to construct an explicit condenser, as I've said, <coughs> with a constant number of rows of seats, and this will give us a constant number of rows. Okay, it's just by combining uh, s uh, two known constructions, um, a simple claim. Okay, so we get a condenser with a constant number of rows. More specifically, if you're interested, the seed length depends only on the error of the condenser, and we apply it with a constant error. So we get a constant number of rows. And y prime is still only a function of y. Okay, now most of the rows of y prime are good. They have large density. But we prove something stronger because we can't allow to aggregate the error epsilon of the condenser throughout our construction. What we prove is that with high probability over y, this table, we want to treat it as a table of seeds for us as extractor. And we prove that on ever, on, with high probability, this table has many rows that are good seeds for us as extractor. Okay, so we do not aggregate this uh, error of the condenser. And we now apply a extractor where x is the source and every row of y prime is the seed. And this means this property of us extractor? It's, okay, good. So this property, which is crucial for us, that we don't aggregate this error, we don't say like, this row is close to uniform, where the close is the error of RAS plus the error of the cone, is using the fact that RAS can be seen as a two-source extractor, and every two-source extractor is in some sense strong. Okay? So we, we, man we managed to isolate but the the of, every, of any two-source extractor. Of any two-source extractor. Okay. Okay, so up until now, we're fine. Okay, yeah, we won't go any further. It's a somewhere random condenser. You a give a somewhere random condenser, right? Yeah, but it's, it's mostly somewhere. It's, it's somewhere random, but it's mostly somewhere. For everyone. So, yeah, it, it says it's somewhere random. So you're saying yeah. your, your additive combinatorics yeah. condenser is actually not a somewhere random condenser, it's a condenser? Yeah. Almost every, I'm just saying almost everything. So it's a condenser. I thought it was a somewhere random condenser. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so for, for those of you who know, I just, um, we can apply the condensers from additive combinatorics, either your or, or, or David's, and then apply a DKSS merger um, that the seed length there does not uh, depend on, on, the, on the length of the row. Okay, what we now have is that most of the rows of y double prime are uniform, and there is a small set of bad rows, but obviously that's not good enough for us, because we need to output a single good value. We want to construct a two-source extract or a Ramsey graph. So, although most, and al also, although most of the rows of y double prime are very close to uniform, they're obviously highly correlated. So I will stop here, I'll just uh, say that the rest of the construction uses, uses uh, ideas similar to recent construction of multi-source extractors, for example, by Lee and by Chad Opadihai and Zuckerman. Uh, but we need to handle some uh, new challenges. Uh, for example, we will end up reusing Y. Um, as I said, uh, we are very stingy on the errors, so they uh, must not be simply aggregated, but uh, we need to be careful about them. We also handle a set of bed rows that depend on the samples, not on the distribution, the on the samples, not on the distributions, but you know, let's, let's just go over it. And Is it a non -manageable extractor? Yeah, 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 yeah. And again, I'm happy to talk about it later on. Okay. 
And kind of my favorite uh, takeaway uh, challenge from this talk is uh, constructing good linear strong dispersals. So as we said, we cannot hope to get these parameters for, for linear dispersals because for linear dispersal k is at least log one over epsilon. But we can hope to achieve this one times here. Okay. And when I say linear, sorry for, um, for those of you who are not familiar with it, just simply means that for every fixed seed, the function is a linear transformation. Okay, so it's like I have a collection of linear transformations, a small collection of linear transformations. Now this would give good linear erasure list decodable codes and also allow efficient list decoding, right? Because doing list decoding in erasure codes is simply linear algebra. And the codes I showed here today are not linear. We don't have to go through the construction to see it because they achieve something not achievable by linear codes. So a linear one would get a, would get a poly and list decoding algorithm. And if we also manage to do that, uh, outputting many bits, it has application to what's called subspace designs and certain extractors and list recoverable codes. And I think it's a very nice uh, object to try and construct. Okay, that's it, thank you.